Welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. I'm Kerry Schertz, the Backyard Professor. As I've been studying uh, early Christianity, of course you run across the various different types of Christian groups that were in existence, Jewish Christian as well as Christian as well as Gnostic Christian groups. And because of the, uh, because of the archaeological discoveries, such as the Gnostic texts that were found at Nag Hammadi in uh, 1945 and the Gospel of Judas in 1973, the more and more and more of the Gnostic texts come out and now we begin to see not the pagans but the actual Christians. We are now recognizing that early Christianity was much broader more diverse, more meaningful, more spiritual than we have ever been known to suppose before because of archaeology and history and historical analysis has demonstrated to us that the the spectrum, I'll put it this way, the spectrum of spirituality within Christianity was incredible. Unfortunately, the church fathers did not like the spectrum being so broad. They lived in an era of what they indicated was severe persecution. And in order for the converts and for the various branches of Christianity to survive the onslaughts of a pagan world that was much stronger than they ever were, they believed they had to force a unification of thought of, uh, of belief, of expression, a, a unity of doctrine whereby they could cohere together as a group and survive. In, in some ways it reflects a, a great disbelief in the power of God to preserve them in their diversity of faith and expression and it shifted from a, a spiritual understanding, a spiritual basis and background, into a political, die-hard, determined need to survive. Unfortunately, what they lost was the grandness of their heritage. What we lost, I should say, is the grandness of their heritage. For the first four or five hundred years, of course, there was no canon, there was no set doctrine. They, uh, various different churches had their own, and each, each of the different communities had one or more of the Gospels, etc. Irenaeus, of course, put that all together and said, no, there's not only one Gospel, and no, there's not twelve Gospels to match the twelve Apostles or anything like that. No, there's just four. And he limited God. He said, any revelation that comes in from now on has to conform to these four Gospels that we chose. Otherwise, it's not a valid revelation of God, and therefore the church essentially limited God. Of course, I'm sure I can picture God. He's laughing from on high saying, oh, really? You think that I've given you everything in those Gospels as they interpreted the story, which is completely different from each other in many respects? Each had their own specific type of audience, their own particular situation that they wrote for, so they couldn't possibly indicate the entire truth anyway. We can't limit God that way. We like to pretend we can, but we can't. Well, one of the expressions that has come out now is this Gnostic idea. Now, there's no question that the vagaries of the Gnostics uh, are incredible. Some of their scriptural exegesis is just downright bizarre, but it's only bizarre because we haven't seen it. We're not used to it. We don't, we haven't ever had it to compare and contrast, so we have grown up and gotten used to our understanding of what came down in antiquity as Christianity from the Great Consolidation. And we like to assume that that alone is the truth. I want to take a look at what Irenaeus called evil exegesis, of what Irenaeus identified as satanic scriptural knowledge. 
And he had to label his opponents this way to eliminate them, at least in his mind. We are of God because there's a greater majority of us, and that means there's lesser of you, and therefore you're of evil. And so we have to stamp you out. That was the underlying operative assumption, and I don't think that was a good assumption at all. Unfortunately, historically, for the last 2,000 years, we've been stuck with the basis of that assumption. Now that we have the Gnostic materials, we can read them for ourselves. And that's what I'm going to do for you in this video. I'm going to at least share a couple of Gnostic ideas that Irenaeus specifically labeled as evil and satanic. And let's see what he was trying to say, because there's absolutely nothing evil or satanic in any of this stuff. And once again, I'm going to share some excerpts from you with you from Elaine Pagel's book, The Origin of Satan. She's noting about the Gnostics on page 167. This is a basic overview of something. Now, when we say Gnosticism, of course, we're not talking about a unified movement any more than we are when we mention Christianity. Christianity had dozens, if not hundreds, of different kinds of developed processes, theologies, beliefs, ideas. And uh, it's the same thing with the Gnostics. The, the most famous Gnostic schools are the school of Basilides and Valentinus, to name just two. There's a Sethian school and, and so on and so forth. But here's one such teaching of the Gnostics that Irenaeus specifically labeled as evil. Now this is fascinating. Gnosis reveals who we are and who we have become, where we are going, whence we have come, what birth is, and what rebirth is. What the Gnostic Christian finally comes to know is that the gospel of Christ can be perceived on a level deeper than the one shared by all Christians. One who takes the path of Gnosis discovers that the gospel is more than a message about repentance and forgiveness of sins. It becomes a path of spiritual awakening, through which one discovers the divine within. The secret of Gnosis is that when one comes to know oneself at the deepest level, one comes to know God as the source of your being. That's a pretty good nutshell view of what Gnosis was. The Gnostic said, we are by design our inheritance the fundamental ground reality is simply that we share in the divine. And this is what is important to know. Because once you know yourself, you know the basis of the ground of your being, God. Not just intellectually, but you come to know it in your heart. Irenaeus set it up so that he put the church between the individual and God as the mediator between me and you and Christ and from Christ to the Father. The church put itself in between us and Christ as the source of our salvation. And Irenaeus and Tertullian and Oregon and some of the early church fathers felt that it was very necessary to have this because as individuals we weren't spiritual enough. As individuals we couldn't possibly learn the doctrine of our own. It takes a church to teach us the truth. It takes a church to protect us. It takes a church to help us continue existing and grow and develop spiritually. It takes the church's interpretation of scripture for us to know how to understand the scripture. We don't have that capacity personally. Gnosis said, nothing doing. That's not true at all. Every one of us have the divine within us, and every one of us certainly have the capability. We are created by God also. God did not create us inferior spiritually, intellectually, physically, etc. God knows what he's doing when he created us. The church says, oh no, 
No, God doesn't have that capacity to teach you individually the truth. We must do so for you. That's essentially the difference between orthodoxy and Gnosticism. It's the difference between individual spirituality or groupthink. That's the basic difference between Gnosticism and churchism, I'll put it. On page 173, Pagels notes that the central theme of the Gospel of Philip in the Gnostic writings is the transforming power of love. That what one becomes depend upon what one loves. Whoever matures in love does not care to cause distress to others. Blessed is the one who has not caused grief to anyone, and Jesus Christ is the paradigm for this idea of one who does not offend or grieve anyone, but refresh, refreshes and blesses everyone he encounters, whether great or small, believer or unbeliever. See, the most Christian, then, must always temper the freedom Gnosis conveys with love for others. The author says, too, that he looks forward to the time when freedom and love will harmonize spontaneously together so that the spiritually mature person will be free to follow his or her own true desires without grieving anybody else. Instead of commanding one to eat this, or don't eat that, or do this or don't do that, as does the former tree of the law, what Gnosticism does is, the true tree of Gnosis will convey perfect freedom. When Gnosis harmonizes with love, the Christian will be free to partake or to decline according to his own heart's desire. The person makes his own choice, in other words. What Gnosis does is it conveys freedom from being told what to believe and how to believe it and what to do, with the free choice of the individual to turn to God and let God guide his life. This is what the Church Fathers fought against in Gnosticism. And the interpretation that Philip gives, the Gospel of Philip, is very interesting with the human inclination to either have the inclination for evil or for good within each person. Now see, Irenaeus and Tertullian and Oregon and Lactantius and all of the early church fathers, Basel, and so on and so forth, they externalized this, what the Jews would call this impulse of evil. They ascribed it to a malignant being, Satan. And they said, Satan is influencing you. But the Gnostics probably inherited this uh, theme of the internal desire of the person for either good or ill from the Jewish side of things with this good or evil inclination, which is also identified very powerfully in the Dead Sea Scrolls. When one recognizes this inclination within oneself, then you can change yourself for the good. This is what the Gnostic said. You don't have to relinquish your own spirituality to somebody else, to their whim and understanding. You don't have to trust in the arm of flesh of someone else. You have the capacity to make an intelligent choice yourself. This is the essential basis of Gnosis, as we now understand from their own writings. And this is something that Irenaeus and Tertullian, those guys, called evil. Now that we have the writings and we read them, we say, scratch our heads and we go, that's evil? <laughs> you see, but remember, Tertullian said, the true Christian should not ask questions. The true Christian should not think. The true Christian should shut up, sit down, and obey us, the church. The Gnostic said there's no point of another intermediary between us and Christ. We can turn directly to Christ ourselves. And this the church fathers wouldn't do. They said nothing doing. Get rid of this heresy. That's evil. It's evil to be able to make a choice. We want to force you to heaven through our church. That's a very interesting comparison contrast, you know.
Joseph Smith said, by proving contraries, truth is made manifest. Well, you can't prove contraries unless you do very broad research and reading and see what others say about this or that or thus and so. And you learn for yourselves the truths of history. You don't have to rely on someone else. You've got a God-given brain. Use it. Well, I'm very Gnostic in that sense. Absolutely. I side with them in that respect that I have my freedom and I'm going to use it the way I want to, to learn what I want to. I have that right and I have that God-given capacity. I'm going to use it. This is the beauty of the Gnostics. The optimistic conviction of truth is what the Gnostics were after. Now, from the Gnostic end of things, of course, we have this idea of the ignorance of error. Ignorance because we are not allowed to use our brains for ourselves. We are not allowed to read the scriptures for ourselves. No, the church said, take away the copies of the scripture out of the hands of the people. Only we know the true interpretation. Therefore, we will give it to you, and therefore salvation is through the church, not through Christ. They usurped Christ's authority. The Gnostics wouldn't have anything to do with that. They said, no, I can do this on my own, thanks. I don't need you to interpret what I can figure out for myself. And this helped keep the diversity of Christianity around for many hundreds of years. Knowing the truth involves more than an intellectual process, however. It involves transformation of one's being, transformation of one's way of living. If we know the truth, we shall find its fruits within us, is how the Gnostic teaches this. If we join ourselves with it, with the truth from within here, then is how we find fulfillment. This is knowledge, the Gnosis. Know for yourselves. This is the idea of Gnosis. And, and Pagels does a very good job. That was on page 174. She does a very good job giving us the, the comparison and the contrast and the teachings of how the early church fathers wanted to unify Christianity and how the Gnostics wanted to discover the truth. Because the church would not teach that each individual is divine. To the church, that was false doctrine. To the Gnostic, it was obvious truth. <laughs> this was the big battle. This is one of the big battles, I should say. The power of studying history, now that we have far more of it, <laughs> now that we have the larger picture of Christianity, we can begin to use this as the basis for recognizing that, I mean, there are some people today who are really confused about the state. You'll look around and there's thousands of churches. Well, the good news for us is it was the same way back in Jesus' day too. Everyone was struggling to understand the truth. And everyone in one form or group or another claims to have that truth. And everyone wants your attention and your allegiance. And if you can find a group that you're comfortable with, then you should. If you can't find a group you're comfortable with and you believe it's an individual process, the good news is it is. Because that is also part of the Christian spectrum. And you say, well, that's not true because the Gnostics were considered heretics. Yes, by a majority rule of people who were so closed-minded, they said God no longer speaks and everything that comes down now must conform with what we have already in the scriptures that we have chosen. No, I think there's a much better basis to figure out truth. I personally can't help it. I side with the Gnostics in this regard that Jesus really did say 
ask and it shall be given, knock and it shall be opened. And I don't care if Tertullian couldn't comprehend that it's a whole lifetime process. I don't care if his mind was so small. He wanted the answer right now. And he wanted the fundamental truth right now. And he thought he found it. And therefore, in good old satanic spirit fashion, he virtually forced everyone in his day to accept his version. I don't care on that basis of criteria. I am not beholden or I am not stuck with accepting Tertullian's vision of the truth. I can find out for myself. And that's what I'm doing. In the process of learning the history of the incredible range of early Christian literature, for example. It's gigantic. It's huge. You can't believe it. Or learning the history of the different Christian movements. Learning the history of the individual mystics through the Middle Ages. Learning the history of the church and its triumphant military access to Christ. They turned him into a generalissimo and marched forth against the infidel and wiped out people in the Crusades. Well, you know, that's not my view of what the church should be about, you know. Everybody has their own definition and all. I believe God's greatness and goodness is that he has the capacity to accept all worship, no matter of what kind. It's only humans who seek to limit God. I don't accept the early Christian church leaders' ideas that we humans do not have the intelligent capacity to make our own spiritual choices. And so we need a mediator to Christ. It's just like I've said before. The church is not what was crucified on the cross and shed its blood for my sins. I don't need a mediator between me and Christ. I need to turn to Christ. To me, that's sensible, quite frankly. The early Christians believed that the only way to have group solidarity was to crush out the diversity. Could you imagine if they would have said the same thing about the world and cut down every kind of tree in the world except the only one true tree, say a pine tree? Could you imagine how miserable that would be? Could you imagine if they would have declared only one color is the true color of God and all others are satanic inspired? And therefore, since we as a major group like the color red, everything must be red. And they tried to turn the world into solid red. Everything. Could you imagine how silly that would be? Or if they would have said, music is God's creation, but there's only one true musical instrument, the banjo. And an orchestra can only have banjos. And there's only one true song so that they can only play one true song. Could you imagine how boring that would be to go to that orchestra and listen to them pluck all together in unison on all one instrument, just one song? True beauty is found in the diversity of the world. Because what does it do? What do the heavens declare as well as this grand creation. Now this is opposite of what the Gnostics taught. This is where I completely disagree with the Gnostics. They taught the creation was evil, that it was bad, that matter is evil. I don't accept that at all. Peter in the Clementine Recognitions taught Clement, we do not think matter is evil as such. Amen, Peter, you're right. Matter is not what's evil at all. It is through the diversity of the beauty of the different colors that we enjoy the fall season with all the different colors of leaves on the trees, the different shapes and colors of rock, the different animals. Could you imagine if the church would have declared there's only one true animal of God, the chipmunk, and wiped out all the other animals? What kind of insanity is that? Well, we allow them to say the same thing about spirituality, though, or about interpretation of the scripture, or even about scripture. Why do we allow that when it's as obviously patently absurd there as it would be if they did that in the world? It's astounding that diversity of thought terrifies churches. It always has. 
Isn't that amazing? And yet God says in Isaiah, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. God created the diversity. He created our eyes so that we could contemplate the various thousands and trillions of different shades of color and shape and kinds of animals and plants and rocks and planets in the sky. The space telescope with all those magnificent pictures do not show that heaven is all uniform and the same color and the same shape. No, the glory and beauty of it all is because of the diversity. Not the unity, but the diversity brings out the beauty. It's okay for individuals to be individuals and find their truth. But for whatever reason, this really makes churches nervous. They don't want thinkers. They want believers. But you can be a thinker and a believer all at once. Perhaps I'm just not getting it. And that's very possible for sure. But as I explore these themes, I'm sharing them with you in my videos. I'm thinking out loud. I'm sharing the grandeur, the wonder of it all, when you study history that you're not going to get in church. Church doesn't teach you the history of much of anything. What it wants to teach you is an interpretation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the final complete picture. God isn't contained within a human interpretation of God's Word. There's much more to God than just what's in print. That's my message. It's fun to explore that greatness of God. So thanks for watching my video. I think the uh, sun's trying to hide behind the cloud. So anyway, it's time for me to stop. So hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next video.